is a medical doctor. He specializes in respiratory uh, medicine. Okay. And one thing so that I love, it. it's about breathing, it's about lungs. your lungs, mm -hmm. your heart, your the pulmonary okay. system. And I, I particularly enjoy the fact that he uses it to bring about change in society. Hello to you and welcome. This is Visionaries. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, sometimes we choose our careers, but other times our careers choose us. Our guest today is a medical doctor specializing in pulmonary medicine. He chose this area of specialization in response to the needs of the people around him. Let's find out a little bit more about this. It's a huge pleasure for me to introduce Professor Kutin Deda. Prof, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Thanks, Ayanda, and thanks for uh, having me on your show. You know, on this show, we like to start at the beginning, but in your case, I'm going to go right to the beginning, to your grandfather, as a matter of fact. I have it on good authority that he was part of the uh, Indian underground resistance to British rule. Tell me a little bit more about him and when he came to South Africa. Yeah, my grandfather, I mean, uh, my, both my grandfathers came to South Africa in the 1890s. The one, the one was a tailor seeking a better life, and he went to Durban. And uh, word has it that my maternal grandfather, in fact, uh, back in the day, was involved with the Indian resistance at the time. And he'd come to South Africa and uh, therefore fled inland and uh, ended up in Pretoria. And uh, he was an entrepreneur and a very strong-willed chap. And uh, amazingly, even, you know, in the, in the 60s, at the height of of uh, of apartheid he got his pilot's license wow. uh, then went on to open uh, an envelope factory and in fact even in his 90s he passed away at the sort of in the mid 90s uh, age wise and uh, even uh, you know in his late uh, 80s and early 90s uh, he he was still involved in business and uh, really was very inspirational mm. uh, to the whole family and even to me my goodness, we have a picture of one of your grandfathers. You need to tell me if this is the maternal or the paternal grandfather. Yes, that's my uh, maternal grandfather, and okay. that's in fact taken in Pretoria, uh -huh. uh, you know, at the family home there. And uh, I grew up in Durban as a child, and uh, usually at the end of every year or every second year, uh, the so-called school holidays, we ended up uh, in Pretoria. Ah, and tell me about how that shaped you as a child. What, what sort of child were you? What were you like? So I was, I mean, I grew up in uh, downtown Durban, mm -hmm. uh, in the inner city. Uh, there was a very strong ethos of education, uh, culture, uh, and uh, going on to family, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the families were very big back then on my uh, mother's side and on my father's side. There were nine siblings on each side. My goodness. Yes. Uh, but all of them, uh, you know, were very encouraging. Yeah. And everybody contributed and helped both financially mm. uh, and from an encouragement point of view. Uh, so, you know, there, there, there were lots of hurdles and it yeah. was a sort of an adverse environment in retrospect compared to, you know, what my kids experience today. Uh, but it was a wonderful time and... Uh, Very vibrant, I think. Absolutely, yeah. And, and your immediate family, any siblings? Yeah, so I have a brother who also grew up uh, down in 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 Durban, mm -hmm. uh, we we lived in a in a one bedroom flat in a, in a high rise, and the status quo of, that was the status quo of many families. So there were five of us: a sister and a brother. My mm -hmm. brother was ten years younger than me. He's a, he's a nephrologist, kidney specialist in Australia, yeah. and my sister's a management consultant. But there were five of us, and we we lived in a one bedroom apartment. So by day, uh, the one room served as a, as a living room and a dining room. Sure. And at, in the evening, it served as a, as a bedroom for three children. Uh, I remember when I was, um, when I was in primary school, uh, you know, my cupboard was really a, a little suitcase under my parents' bed. That's where I kept all my clothes. My and, word. And uh, b because, you know, we, we didn't have space uh, for a cupboard. And, um, uh, but but it was fun. It was lovely. I had uh, wonderful memories of my childhood and mm. growing up in in Durban Central, and uh, you know there were hundreds of families that grew up in that that yeah. precinct, the Cas Casper precinct. Yeah. As a child, um, you were happy, so you didn't you didn't realize what you had and what you didn't have, I suppose. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And then when did you decide to get into medicine? 
Well, uh, I decided uh, when I was in matric mm -hmm. that I was uh, going to do medicine. Uh, initially, in fact, I applied for engineering and medicine. And there were two things I was very interested in, the energy crisis uh, at the time, which uh, uh, curiously is still with us. Mm. Um, and in fact, when I started university, one of my nicknames, because I'd been involved in an interview when I got my matric results, was energy crisis deader. So that's what they used to call <laughs> me in the past year. Uh, but I uh, had an extended family where uh, there was a strong influence of medicine. Uh, my uncle was a doctor and my aunt was a dentist. Uh, and I, I, I was quite intrigued by uh, various aspects of, of health and healthcare. Uh, and so those are sort of two things that I was quite interested in. Mm -hmm. I was scientifically orientated uh, and there was, this, there was quite, a, quite a few breakthroughs in medical science at the time. Uh, but having said that, you know, one really has very little idea what one is getting oneself into, mm. even if you do a bit of work experience. Mm. And uh, so we applied and I was accepted uh, for medicine at several universities and then decided to go to Johannesburg because uh, I wanted to get away from home. And uh, Cape Town was out. My, my folks said it's too far and you know, we couldn't, aff I couldn't afford to go there. And there was extended family in Johannesburg and in Pretoria. So, you know, I ended up at, at WITS. Do you know what, what I'm starting to pick up here? Because you mentioned the energy crisis. You mentioned also the health component of things. That you were very much like your grandfather. You know, that activism streak was always in you. You wanted to respond to the challenges of the time. Because even your area of specialization, so you go and you study medicine. But for you to get into, you know, the pulmonary side of things, there's a story behind that. And that's what I want to know. What happened? Well, I think my sort of one light bulb moment uh, uh, sort of came uh, around about 1992. And I was doing my internship at King Edward Hospital in Durban. And um, I was really uh, um, fascinated by this disease. Uh, and um, I, uh, it was a scourge. And in fact, it was the biggest killer of mankind. Over a billion people killed over the last two centuries. Mm -hmm. And it remains the biggest infectious disease killer and the commonest cause of death in the country, by the way. And, but the strange thing um, and, and, and amazing thing about tuberculosis is that um, there still doesn't exist an effective vaccine. Uh, two out of five cases of TB globally are missed. Mm. They, they're never diagnosed because of the suboptimal diagnostic test that we have. Um, and if that wasn't enough, uh, the antibiotics used to treat TB uh, span a period of six months and it's very unpleasant to take. Yeah. Uh, and now we have uh, uh, drug resistant TB strains and in fact we have strains of TB uh, that are virtually incurable. Mm. And that's sort of the, some of the work we've done in our lab focusing on that area and particularly drug resistant TB. So that's initially what sparked my whole interest in respiratory medicine because in fact uh, the entire field of respiratory medicine uh, was spawned because of tuberculosis. Mm. And uh, although now respiratory medicine encompasses, you know, asthma and COPD and lung cancer, its primary purpose uh, in the, in the I, I, you know, 50 or 60 years ago was really to take care of the complications of tuberculosis because yes. it predominantly affected the lung. Mm. And um, I decided at that stage that uh, this is the career I wanted to follow. Uh, an academic one and really to uh, train in respiratory medicine. An article that I read, and I think it was dated 2014, 2015 or thereabout, called you the rising star of pulmonary medicine. I want to find out exactly why and where that star shone to in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back and thank you so much for staying with us. Just before the break, Professor Deda was sharing with us just some of the harsh conditions in which South Africa found itself. That is what led to him studying further afield in the area of respiratory medicine. So, Prof, tell me a little bit about how you decided to then go to London to better equip yourself to be the change you want to see here at home. Well, at the time, uh, I felt for several reasons I wanted to go overseas. Mm. Uh, I wanted to really experience uh, what it was like to live in a society and an environment 
where people were not judged by uh, the color of their skin or where they came from. And uh, secondly, uh, I wanted to experience uh, and get a grasp on several new technologies uh, and scientific techniques. I was very keen to do my PhD and um, I got a scholarship there, uh, a British Lung Foundation scholarship to do my PhD, uh, which was very competitive at the time. And when I got to the UK, uh, I had to get a training number to train in respiratory medicine. So the way the system worked is that there were a limited number of posts and positions and one had to compete for them. And this was in open competition uh, with British doctors. You know, I went for an interview. There were five of us. There were two training numbers and I was awarded one of the training wow. numbers. So, so that's how it all started. I finished my respiratory training um, in London uh, um, in several of the very prominent hospitals there. Uh, the Middlesex Hospital, Royal Free Hospital, uh, did my PhD at University College London, one of the top five universities in the UK. Wow. Uh, and then um, uh, my topic of research was tuberculosis and I was looking at uh, uh, how the immune system in the lung uh, responds to dealing with the, with the TB bug. Uh, and that led me on to publish some seminal papers. Mm -hmm. Uh, under the mentorship of Professor Graeme Rook at the time. Uh, of course, one needs good mentors and he mm. was one of them. And, um, and, and I continued with my research uh, as a senior lecturer uh, up to 2006 to 2008. And mm. then, you know, decided that I wanted to come back home. My goodness. Um, give something back to the country and uh, be closer to the family and the extended family. And of course, the weather as well uh, mm -hmm. would mm -hmm. have been a factor. So it was a number of different reasons. And um, that's when I got a call from uh, Professor Bongani Mayozi, oh. who I actually hadn't met prior to that. And um, he called me and he said, listen, I want to talk to you. I heard you coming back to South Africa. And he <laughs> said to me, there's only one place to go to, and that's the University of Cape Town. And I said, no, but you know, uh, my family is in Durban and I'm going to go there. And he said, no, he wasn't hearing any of it. And he had arranged a whole startup package of funding and uh, some research opportunities. And he spent a lot of time and energy because there wasn't a, you know, you know, the system is such mm. that there wasn't a post readily available that I could just walk into. So he, he actually had to, to fashion things himself <laughs> and make a plan, so to speak. And that's exactly what it did. And uh, so I came down to Cape Town with the family and the rest was history. And boy, are we glad you came back because the work that you did, I mean, you won accolades and, and you must tell me all about them now because my memory is not going to, to serve me very well. But you won accolades. You were groundbreaking in your interventions that you made there. Um, you also gave back in so many ways. Tell me a little bit about that period and what you were able to achieve. Yeah, so, I mean, I, um, several months ago, um, I was uh, given an A rating by the National Research Foundation. Mm -hmm. And we're one of the few countries in the world, actually, where uh, scientists uh, are rated uh, for the science they produce. And essentially, um, uh, uh, it's a hierarchy, hierarchical ranking. Mm -hmm. And A rated scientists are few and far between and essentially uh, global research leaders in a particular field. Uh, and so this was a wonderful affirmation mm. of the work over the last uh, decade done at my lab at UCT. But, um, you know, one accepts this, this, these kind of awards on behalf of a whole group of people. Mm. Uh, the other thing that we're very strong on developing is innovation. Mm. And I think South Africans have been really good in following and, uh, you know, following protocols and 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 following in the footsteps of what many people have created but um we did do it at one stage but i think we need to get it back and yeah. that's creating for ourselves mm -hmm. uh, so for example in my lab we um have now have five patents um i'll just tell you a little bit about our one or two of them yes, please. so for example one of them uh, speaks to developing a new test for extra pulmonary forms of TB, TB outside the lung, that's quite difficult to diagnose. And there's a UCT co-owned startup company now uh, called Antrim Biotech. And they've now developed this new test, which is working very well and is gonna be launched next year. Um, 
another example is um, uh, a patent we have um, uh, together with another research group mm -hmm. at UCT, the Blackburn Lab, and this uh, a patent uh, is 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 really to do with um, the discovery of a set of novel TB-specific proteins in the urine. Wow! Um, so now what this opens uh, the door up to is taking a simple urine sample and making a diagnosis of TB, much like a pregnancy type. Wow. Uh, you know, dipsticks type wow. or lateral flow assay type of test. And the big problem with TB at the moment is we need to get a spit sample. And um, there are molecular and other tests uh, that we use to test the spit sample. The problem is in about 40% of cases, you cannot get a spit sample. Children, it's very difficult to get it in children. Mm. And even if one does get a spit sample, particularly in HIV infected people, which is a big problem in our country, the concentration of the bugs are so low that you can't detect it in the spit. So it's a huge problem. And so the real idea is to take TB diagnosis out of the clinics, take it out of the hospitals, take it into the community, mm. where anyone who has a cough could go to their local pharmacy or health kiosk in pick and pay, get one of these tests yeah, and be goodness. tested for TB. The one test is already in advanced clinical trials and mm -hmm. will be launched next year. And the other one is still in development. My goodness. I don't know where you find the time because on top of it all, you also uh, founded an organization, Free of TB. Correct me if I'm wrong. Tell me about what you do there. Yeah, so Free of TB uh, is a charity that um, I founded and I co-direct. Uh, and it was founded several years ago. And it was really uh, in response to assisting patients uh, with tuberculosis who didn't have access uh, to s uh, certain tools, yeah. uh, be it medical or non-medical. And um, its role was to educate, uh, was to provide um, uh, testing that wasn't otherwise available through the healthcare system. Mm. And so, for example, at Krutus Kier Hospital, uh, for the last three years now, uh, free of TB has been providing these tests mm. so that uh, we can make a quick and rapid diagnosis uh, of TB and you know that's saved many lives. My goodness. So you're saving lives via your research, via your interventions and I like that it's practical on the ground work as well. So the question that I have yet to ask I suppose is what does the future have in store for Prof Data? What does he still want to achieve? We'll find that out and also what he does to relax, hey? Because he's doing a whole lot of working. So what about the play? We'll find that out in just a moment. Don't go away. Welcome back and thank you so much for staying with us. You'll be glad you did because we've added a little bit of extra cuteness on set. We're joined by Karina, Prof Deda's daughter, and she's going to spill the beans on some of her dad's silly habits or maybe what he does for fun. Karina, thank you for joining us. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good and you? Good, thank you. So now, how did you get to go with daddy when there are actually three of your kids in the family? Well, because my sister, mm -hmm. well, my brother has got camp. Okay, your brother's on camp. And your sister? She has this thing at school called market day. Okay, so they're busy. But I have a feeling that you're possibly daddy's favorite. We won't say it out loud so nobody else will hear. Do, do, I, do I have something that's correct there? Am I right? Ah, look at that. <laughs> you know, if anyone have it, had an e evil smile that was cute, it's you. It's like, <laughs> you have daddy wrapped around your little finger, hey? Do you get away with a lot of stuff? Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. What do you do for fun as a family? What do you guys enjoy doing? Well, we like going for walks mm -hmm. because we live next to a river. And are there any frogs or any creepy crawlies when you guys go for walks? Um, tadpoles. Tadpoles. Okay. Is Daddy afraid of tadpoles? No. Does he always want to cut them up because he's a doctor? You know, doctors like cutting things no. up. No, he doesn't. He behaves. Prof, other than walks, what else do you enjoy doing with your family? Um, well, we go to the beach often. Uh, uh -huh. We go on holidays. Uh, we like going to see different countries. Yes. And uh, I cycle a lot. Uh, the Cape Town's beautiful for cycling, so often cycle from Newlands where I live. We have a group of buddies who cycle together. I usually cycle down to Cape Point and mm -hmm. back. 
It's a very picturesque, beautiful cycle to see the whales in September. Mm. And then uh, I do some open water swimming uh, and, uh, yeah, enjoy swimming the mile now and then in the summer. So um, that's what I do to keep fit. I play, play a bit of squash with my son, mm -hmm. who's 15. Um, and I think that with um, spending time with the, um, with the four of them yeah. and uh, doing a bit of the research and a bit of teaching and seeing patients is, uh, is more than enough mm -hmm. to keep one's mm -hmm. uh, hands more than full. Of course, and of course, mummy's also at home, hey, and that's why it's, it's the four. So tell me, what do we not know about daddy? What is the, um, maybe the silliest thing about him? Does he snore maybe at night? Does he drink the milk out of the bottle and not in a glass? What do we not know about daddy that you think we should know? Well, <laughs> he puts salt in his water. I don't know why. <gasps> daddy, you put salt in your water? I Why? love salt. I love salt. I work very hard. I sweat, so. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for spilling the beads on that one. What do you hope to achieve going forward, especially in a country where, you know, the, the, the public health care sector gets lambasted almost on a daily basis for all the things that it does wrong? Apart from uh, continuing the research we're doing, mm -hmm. and really my dream, I guess, if it ever gets there, is to see the eradication of TB. Of course, not on my own. There are so many other people working in this area at so many different levels. Um, of course, my visions are to uh, develop the sputum independent test for TB mm -hmm. that I was alluding to earlier on, and really to um, uh, facilitate the improved diagnosis of TB. Yeah. Uh, and um, there's this notion that the best care expertise uh, and infrastructure in fact is in the private sector mm. uh, it shouldn't be so uh, we are the you know the Curtis Gear Hospital is the academic center uh, uh, really providing tertiary care together with Tigerberg to the population of the Western Cape and uh, we are arguably uh, the leading center of pulmonary medicine uh, in, in, in Africa that is I would, what I like I would to say hear. I think we have enough resources in this country we have enough expertise uh, we have enough money uh, but it's just a matter of um, putting these together mm. and interfacing them to solve uh, the health challenges we have. We have a phenomenal um, degree of, uh, or we, we have a phenomenal burden of, 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 of unmet needs yeah. and health challenges in this country. Uh, but I think if we um, you know, all put our heads together and use innovative models, mm -hmm. um, I, I think this can definitely change. And for me, I think leadership plays a very pivotal role. So thank you for leading in this regard. I really appreciate it. And thank you for spending some time with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. And you, Miss Missy, thank you for coming. I hope to either one day be interviewed by you, but if not, I hope to interview you because it means you'll be doing fantastic things and you two will be a visionary growing up. Deal? Can mm -hmm. you at least give me that deal? Yes. Nod? No? Maybe? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Let's leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for tuning in. We'll see you same time, same place next week. Goodbye. God bless you. Uh, my advice to everyone out there is set goals, uh, particularly five and ten year goals, if you really want to achieve something. Uh, speak to people who've been there already. Take advice. Uh, above all, uh, work hard dream big and really believe in yourself uh, you can do it and uh, if you have any doubts uh, speak to people about it and pr probably the most important piece of advice uh, be comfortable in your own skin don't try to be someone else and emulate another person be confident in yourself believe in yourself and with hard work and patience you'll always get there